What's up, everybody? It's Kevin. It's Wednesday morning. Um, sometime in May. <laughs> Don't know the date. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to jump on this morning and just tell you guys that I missed you yesterday. Uh, hey, Mick Coach is live. It's 8 o'clock. So, anyway, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this morning was uh, vocals. Uh, this is something that's been uh, on my mind lately a lot. And uh, so just wanted to talk to you about how you can get better vocals. One of the things that I really love about being in the studio is being able to get good vocals from people. Uh, I, it's a thing that I feel like it. it's a th I love doing it. I just love doing it. I, there's a lot of psychology involved. And I just wanted to give you a couple of pointers. I don't have anything really like specifically mapped out but i think what i do have to offer is going to help hey say hello in the comments good morning mark uh, i'm going to talk about vocals this morning goodbye good morning isaac um so um vocals it makes or breaks a record right I, i've been talking about sorry my dog is playing with his toy right here i've been talking about vocals a little bit this week because um i'm working on a course uh, on how to tune vocals basically and i'm going to show you everything that i do in melodon i'll give you guys a um, um a login or a, a way to a way to look at it here pretty soon uh, been a crazy week but let's jump over to vocals all right so i was just thinking about this this morning i think vocals if you're whether you're doing vocals yourself whether you're recording them for your band uh whether you're good morning justin whether you're uh take that coffee um Ever how you do vocals? It's full. Got it. Thank you. It's good to know this. So tip number one, vocals are best captured, not coerced. I know. I didn't mean for the alliteration. Well, I did. But they're best captured. If you've ever wondered why live vocals t tend to have this like uh, intangible um, quality about them, it's usually because it's a it's a performance that's captured. Um, the better the singer you have, the more they're able to do this sort of thing, where they're actually able just to do a whole vocal take, and and it'd be good. Um, live singing is great because the vocals are performed, right? They're not just like they're not like um, put out in pieces and then pieced together. Uh, it's performed. Um, so, so think about how you can do vocals that way. Think about how you can get your vocalist or how you can make yourself perform the vocal. Here's another, for instance, like, uh, live vocals are, are usually great, right? Um, I'm a songwriter. So a lot of times, uh, when we write a song, um, we will do a scratch vocal at the end of the song just to capture the work tape. So we'll remember what we wrote, right? <clears throat> a lot of times those vocals are the best ones you're going to get. You know, it's, it's not surprising to me that a lot of times when you, when you are recording uh, a really good singer, a lot of times their first take is going to be one of the best ones, right? First or second take, usually one kind of works out the crud. The second one's usually the one you keep, no matter how long you do it. Usually there's something intangible about that vocal because it's best captured, right? You capture a vocal. So how do you do that? Well, one thing that I always do is I always, always, when I'm warming up vocals, I always capture uh, the stuff. That's why, that's the, the invention of playlists on Pro Tools, one of the best things ever. Because um, um, you can grab the vocal and you don't even have to tell them about it, right? And, and you can be listening to where the trouble spots are going to be if there are any, you know, and you can go back and work on those things. But, but uh, I always, you know, the first pass somebody's doing, I usually try to capture that, right? And sometimes you have to convince people that that is the best one. Uh, and that's why I say, you know, comp vocals together, because then you listen to pass one, pass two, pass three. And then you just pick the best sounding one. They don't necessarily, and you don't necessarily know which one is the best, which one is which take, which one is the first take or the second take or whatever. So thing number one, figure out a way to capture your vocal and not coerce it. Sometimes you, now sometimes you do need to coerce a vocal. Sometimes you need to use studio psychology to 
to get that line that you need or that word you need or that phrasing that you need. And that's time to do it. But for the most part, try to capture the vocal. And a lot of times, too, um, especially, you know, I've, I've discovered this a lot when um, when I was working in this studio with a lot of uh, quartets and trios and things like that. You have to measure whether a vocal is worth completely changing because when you when you change the way a line is phrased or the note and they're not getting the note they don't feel it and you can't get that out of them you have to ask yourself is it worth um is it worth missing out on or is it worth recording the inconfidence or the the things that come with learning a new line and not being sure if you got it right is it worth it to get that but <clears throat> I mean, to get the right note, the right uh, phrasing and miss the feeling of it. That's one thing that um, it's a tough call. Now, luckily, uh, these days you don't have to do that anymore, right? Because you have Melodyne and things like that where you can like, oh, I love the feel of that line. It's just a wrong note. A lot of times I won't even tell people. I just like I'll grab it, capture it in, fix the note, play it back. We're good. Sounded great. Like, oh, I sounded better than I thought I did. <laughs> so anyway, so that that is all measuring that whether you captured the vocal or whether you coerced it. Sometimes you have to, you know, you have to to get the vocal um, through our the tools that we learn, uh, like Melodyne, like Auto Tune, like um, uh, not Beat Detective. What is that uh, warp? You know, warping a vocal. Like uh, in Pro Tools, you can. And I'm, and I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of other dogs, you can just like track it in and you can take, you can see where the warp markers are. And if they sang it a little early, you can just take it and move it back. And, and if you're, um, if you're an engineer that it really thinks about these things, you, you tend to do that stuff without anybody knowing about it. You're kind of like, uh, you know, when nobody's looking, you're kind of nudging the vocal a little bit. They don't need to know that. I mean, don't try to be a superhero by going, oh, you wouldn't believe how much I had to do your vocal. That is not a thing to say to somebody, right? Especially if you want them to come back. You know, I mean, I, I know that you, uh, a lot of times we as engineers try to judge our worth by how much we do to something. Um, I mean, we do a lot of stuff. The guys who do a lot of stuff, you know, they tend to get a lot of work, but not when you talk about how much work it was to get you to sound good, right? Um, so anyway, so I, I guess I'll leave that there, and I'll take some questions right now. And if you want some more, uh, some more little uh, tips like that, uh, I would love to give them because I love talking about capturing vocals. Mm. So. Um, think about how, ways that you can do in your studio. Uh, write in the comments there uh, ways that you have uh, figured out how to capture a vocal, um, how to get that feeling of somebody really feeling what they're singing. Uh, there's nothing better than that. I mean, you can, and a lot of times what I'll do when I am trying to get that special something out of somebody's vocal, um, I'll do what I read that Keith Thomas did one time. I'll say, hey, I want you to imagine that you're this and that you're in this scene or in a movie or whatever. How would you sing this line? How, how would you hear this line in the movie? And sometimes putting them there mentally uh, will allow, will enable them to sing a line in a different way. Um, some, some people want to want to record over the, um, as uh, Karen Peck and Eldridge Fox used to say that teardrop in somebody's voice. Um, those are priceless priceless and if you get a teardrop with a little something in it that you can fix in melodyne then fix it in melodyne right and if you're not confident in melodyne i've got something coming up for you so um just make sure that uh you, uh end of this week beginning of next week you're paying attention so because i'm gonna put it out there okay okay so got a little a few comments coming in um Justin says, keep the live streams coming. I will, man. I, I didn't do yesterday on purpose, and I'm not doing tomorrow on purpose, but I am doing Friday. So uh, I'm going to go to three days a week right now. And on the other days, I'm going to work on creating some um, some like hands-on con uh, content for you guys, too. So uh, thoughts on printing or treating the vocal with plugins or hardware on the way in? Um, that's a good, that's good, Mark. Um, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I do capture the vocal with um, 
with compression. I hardly ever EQ a vocal going going down, just because I feel like you know, if you have to EQ a vocal a lot going down, there's a couple things wrong. You've either got the wrong microphone, which is even hard to find these days, because I found that every new microphone that comes out seems like is a great microphone. I mean, it's hard to find it's, if it's a microphone that's designed for recording vocals or whatever. It's hard to find a microphone that's just like that is just terrible. Because usually they're not terrible, and especially with some of the plugins that you can uh, get um, to to kind of polish it uh, in the later stages, it's hard to find it. So, but sometimes you have the the wrong microphone. But most of the time, it's wrong microphone uh, technique, um, and that is I was thinking about that this morning. When you see a vocalist that really just, uh, digs into a microphone, does everybody know what proximity effect is? say uh mention it in the comment if you if you know what it is so i'll know not to go there but a lot of times when people sing into a microphone uh and they they're eating it all the time you get a hundred percent proximity effect and then you filter for all that stuff and you try to carve out all those frequencies and stuff um and then they pull away from the microphone and then it gets thin sounding right so one of the best things that we can do as engineers is teach people how to get a good vocal how to how to give us a good vocal i should say because there's a there's a lot. That's why um, I recorded. I'm not named dropping here. I just remember this. But I recorded Vince Gill one time uh, on a Sonia Isaacs project, or she was singing on it, and and I had an SM5, which is like an SM7, that little mic, just a dynamic mic. It was an SM5. It's the big fat version of that. It looks like a big Tylenol pill. I always thought. Um, Vince sang into that mic, and it sounded like Vince Gill. Uh, the reason I say that is because these great singers, the reason they're so easy to get vocal sounds on, and people say, I just threw a microphone up, and it sounded good. That's usually the case because it's the singer that usually that, that, that puts down the good performance. If you've got somebody, like, for instance, in church work, um, one of the things I feel like I'm a prophet on that I need to be a more of a prophet on is um, – um, it's teaching people how, how to hold a microphone because if you've got a young singer that's only seen a rapper, they'll hold the microphone right here all the time. And then if they're screaming, they're in the mic. If they're barely singing, they're in that mic. Whereas if you got a good experienced vocalist, they'll usually hold the mic down here. And when they sing a real soft note, then they'll go lower to it. And then when they sing a real loud note, you'll hear them back out a little bit. Right. Um, so, there's a reason that these uh, dream singers, these background singers, they they do even in the studio, they'll stand a certain distance from the mic usually and you'll see their head go back or move in a little bit. Um, and they know how to work a microphone and they give you pretty much a written uh, they they're their own clip gain, right? Um, you, have you guys recorded anybody like that that really works a microphone and you're just like, wow, I'm not having to do anything to this. Um, so anyway, going back to Mark's question. So I, I don't EQ a lot because microphones, they tend to sound okay. You know, everything. I think every mic that we've used on you, Mark, has sounded good, right? Nothing we couldn't work around. Nothing that was like, oh my gosh, we got to do that vocal again. Uh, but what I do do is, is I use dynamics. Um, I use a, a compressor, usually about three and a half to four to one. Um, and I will record the vocal with that. But I'm not digging into the vocal a lot, at least for my effect, because you can't uncompress a vocal. Well, you can, but it's hard to uncompress a vocal after they go down. So I usually just barely touch the vocal with compression. And usually it's for the sake of of really grabbing those really loud notes when somebody either belts it and doesn't back up far enough, or maybe you're in a live room and you can't really back out of the mic because when you back out of the mic, you, you get a lot more room sound, right? So, so thoughts on going to tape. I go to tape with compression, but not usually EQ. If it's EQ, I usually either change the mic or uh, change the way the person is addressing the mic. Um, I usually move them away. Um, um, and before I move on, does everybody know what the 6dB, what I call the 6dB rule is? Let me know if you've heard me talk about this before, because it's scientific. 
I should have worn my lab coat here because I'm going to tell you some scientific stuff, okay? Hey, I was wanting to apologize about this stuff right here. Tell you a quick story. Uh, this used to have a roof on it, and we tore it off thinking that, hey, we're going to tear this down. And during this whole uh, uh, quarantine thing, I'm just going to get some stuff done around the house. Um, and so I tore it off. It took me two weekends to do it. And then we realized that there was a reason that there was a roof on this thing. It was hot. <laughs> It was putting coming right in the house and it was like baking us. We were ended up with a suntan sitting on our couch. Um, so I put a tarp on it. I found this tarp. Uh, I forget where I found this tarp, but anyway, it fit perfectly and we've used it for painting. So I just realized how, how bad that looks. Okay. So let me, let me move on a little bit. Um, uh, Isaac says, I try to put them in the mindset of when they wrote the song. Yeah, that's a great idea, Isaac. That's a great idea. I don't, yeah, sometimes I'll do that too. I think, I think I'll say, Hey, what were you thinking when you wrote this line? I don't say it to where it sounds like it's like, What were you thinking? <laughs> Although sometimes that's the case. Um, but sometimes it's like, What were you thinking when you wrote this song? Tell me the story of how I've done that before too, Isaac. I think it's a great idea. Hey, hey tell me the story of, of, of this song. Tell me a little bit more about it. And then they'll tell me about it and they may even get a little misty about it or, or whatever. And then I'll say, Hey, let's sing it. Just sing it. Don't even worry about it. I got, here's what I do. Put your vocalist at ease. That's another way of, of getting a good performance out of it. Put them at ease. Let them know that you're, they're not messing up anything. Back in the day when we only had one track for vocal, you really had the, you really had to go, do we, um, it's pitch perfect. Do I need to go back and try to get a feel? That is the hardest because it's like, what if you never get that again? What if you never get a performance like that again? Uh, before you could tune and before you had one track, that was really tough. Right now, you've got plenty of tracks and you can tune it. So let them know that, let them know that they're not miss, missing anything. Just like, <clears throat> forget about everything and just sing it for me. Let me know, uh, make me feel it. And a lot of times, here's it. Okay, if I'm going to give you one tip, I'm, I'm going to give it to you right now, okay? It's a golden tip. I'm going to make you wait for it. Here's the thing you can do. Since vocal, best of vocal, the best vocals are performed, get them to perform for you in the studio. That is easier than you think, although it's a little awkward. Um, when I recorded vocals for Jessica King, and I was producing her it was just she and i in the control room and i and i pulled her into the control room because i wanted to be i wanted her to tell me the story and not be on the other side of a glass and i would say jessica look at me when you're singing this and i would look at her and i would be her audience because a lot of times if you think about it a vocalist that sounds so good live but you in the studio and you're wondering what is going on. Why, why aren't they able to sing now? All of a sudden they can't sing. And sometimes it's because they don't have an audience because I know that's one of the reasons I love going live because I know that there's people here listening and they're commenting. And by the way, comments, thank you so much because this is what it's like. It's a, it's a performance of so there's, there's, there's a, there's a certain element about a performer, a musician, and we all are right. Um, that, you know, there's something about performing for somebody that brings out the best in you, right? There, it brings out that that little edge that you can't get in the studio. When you're in the studio and you're like, you know, you have take after take after take and you can do it, but you still never get that performance, perform for somebody or get the vocalist. Let's talk about vocalists again. Get the vocalist to perform for you. Say, hey, and this is where it gets awkward. Hey, look at me when you when you record that. Make me feel what you're feeling. And then there's something that comes on with people and they start doing that. Try me on that and see if that doesn't work. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's a good idea. Put them in the mindset of when they wrote the song or however they feel when they wrote the line. Yeah. Or when they hear the line. Yeah. That's good, man. Okay. So um, Mark says, so you are more about putting a compressor plugin on the track going in rather than a channel strip with all the bells and whistles like UA plugins with it, with a certain thing. Now there is an EQ thing that I always do with vocals. And that is I always filter the vocal going in. If I pull up my, like the API, which is one of the, one of the few plugins that I have with universal audio as a channel strip, I'll pull up the, uh, the U. API, UA API. That's really that's a lot of letters to remember that don't even spell anything. 
um, I'll put a filter on it. And usually uh, I'll do the same thing I tell you to do. I'll run the, the um, high pass filter, which is the low cut, and I'll turn it up until it starts to sound thin. And then I'll pull it back about halfway. And what that does is it cleans up the low end stuff that I don't need. They're never going to sing that low. Uh, there's nothing down there, but, you know, trucks running by outside your studio or air conditioner noise is down there. And I don't even think about it. It's something that there's vocals. Usually you can cut a vocal up to like around 125 uh, without really feeling it. Now, don't, you don't want to hear it. You just want to you just want to know that you filtered that stuff. Right. So anyway, so, yes, I'm all about putting a press compressor on the vocal track going in when it's needed. Uh, I have recorded a vocal with nothing on there with the, with the best singers. And if you think about it, singers don't always like compressors. You know, you can be like, you can read every tutorial that you want to about compressing a vocal and how good it sounds and stuff like that. But when you put it on a vocalist going down, they're going to go, what are you doing to my vocal? They want to hear it get loud. They want to hear it get soft. And that's really a good thing. If you've got, um, um, if you've got a vocalist that, uh, I lost my train of thought. I was reading some of the comments down here. Um, I forgot what I was talking about. Sorry about that. I'm live. Did I mention that? Uh, so, but going back to this question on the screen, yes, I put, I put uh, compressors. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So when you got a vocalist and, and you've got everything squashed down, going to tape and they sing this really loud note and it gets squashed down, they're going to stop giving you that dynamic range a little bit. Which can be good sometimes, but most of the time, most of the time it's not. You want to you want to vote you want to capture that vocalist because you can always clip gain it, you know, trim it up, ride it in the mix, compress it later, and you can experiment with it. When you're uh, when you're recording a vocal, a lot of times they won't sing it as loud on the rundown as they will the the tracking session. Now you should capture both, but a lot of times when they get that excitement when they're performing for somebody, they'll give you that extra ten percent, right? And you want to, you want to, you want to a lot for that. You don't want to run the, the mic pre all the way up to the top. You want to leave room for them to give you that extra 10%, uh, that woo, at the end of a, something like that, you don't want that to destroy, right? You, you want to keep those sort of things. So yes, Mark, I'm about putting a compre compressor going in. Um, but the only bell and whistle that I use on, um, on a mic pre is the filter and a compressor. And I don't, I don't go for the Grammy on the compressor. I just, I just touch it a little bit. So, uh, Mike Spark says, man, I'm sitting here working on vocals, got frustrated and shut it off. Get on YouTube and this is on. Hey, all right, man. Um, okay. So Mike, you've got another question here. I haven't read it yet, but, and I don't know if I know what all this stuff is, but I'm going to see if I can, and let me know if you're still on, man. Um, I mean, I see you. 820, that's three minutes ago. I just can't get my vocals to sound right. I've used a couple of different mics and SE Electronics uh, Z56A2 sounds way too bassy, even if I do a 10 dB cut. Hey, uh, Mike, Greg, glad you're here, man. Um, I, my first instinct is that you're too close to the mic because I don't know. I'm just going to assume you don't know this stuff, I, I, but I'm knowing that full well that you do, but there may be somebody else that doesn't. Um, with patterns on the microphone, when you get a cardioid pattern, which means there is a uh, hot side to the mic, there's a side of the mic that you want to sing in, usually the side with the badge on it, the emblem. Uh, on a cardioid mic, there's a thing called proximity effect. Proximity means closeness, um, and the effect of being close is that the bass goes way up. One of the things that bo bothers me so bad is when I'm listening to the radio, which is rare, and it's a talk show, and they are talking so close to the mic, and they've got the low end so much that my subs in my car are going crazy. I hate that. But you get that from a cardioid mic, which is most every dynamic microphone, every dynamic microphone, I would guess. I don't know if I ever know of a, of a, a different pattern dynamic microphone. But anyway, when you get close to those things, the, the bass goes out the roof, right? It's the, I wouldn't say design. It's a, it's a beautiful mistake of those microphones because if you got somebody that has a really thin vocal, a really thin voice, then you could put them on one of those mics and the mic will give you more low end presence, right? Um, now, I don't know the SE Electronics. I hear they're good mics and I, I hear a lot of good things about them. Um, but 
uh, I would imagine that some of these mics, some of the selling points of these mics is that they're nice and warm for vocals and the warm thing, the mic, uh, when you get tube and cardioid, uh, you can get that proximity effect and it can go out the, it can go, it can really get out of control. So the 10 dB cut, are you talking about a 10 dB cut? Also, I don't know these microphones. I could pull up a picture, I guess, but look at the microphone and see if the 10 dB cut is for, if it's a pad for helping you not to distort something, or if it's a 10 dB, like, I don't think the 10 dB cut is going to help you with proximity effect. Okay. I think the 10 dB cut on there is for gain. Okay. So you may be, you may be treating that just a little bit on, on a lot of microphones. Um, there will be a, a 10 dB cut, which is a pad to keep you from accidentally uh, clipping a mic pre going in. And there's another one that looks like a, it looks like a, it's a, it's a, it's a low cut, but it has a little emblem like this. And, and that means that it's cutting off bass stuff. Okay. So uh, you said this is a tube mic. My suggestion for you is this pull away from the microphone a little bit. If it's, it, is it your vocal or is it somebody else's vocal? Um, okay. You said I'm usually about eight inches away with a pop screen. Okay, is that your only mic is my question. Okay, here's what I would do, Mike. Um, um, by the way, I love this. I feel like I'm talking to you. I really am talking to you, but it's just over chat. Um, here's my suggestion. Uh, let me know in the comments if this is your only mic. Because... There's a thing that happens, and this and I and I actually I feel like I was smart to do this, but I ended up still buying stuff. When you buy something, when you buy that mic that everybody's talking about, that's supposed to sound amazing, and then you don't think it sounds amazing after you get it done, um, there's a thing in your mind uh, that makes you still want to use it, right? Uh, Tim Ferriss told this story in the book The Four Hour Work Week about how he made a um, keto friendly cheesecake, but he misread the directions and he put, um, about 10 times the amount of stevia in the, in the cheesecake than it should have been. And, um, and it was way, way sweet. And he said, I was still sitting there eating it. And I'm thinking, why am I eating this? It tastes terrible. And the reason was he, that he made it. So there's something that says, I made this cake. I've got to eat it, right? You don't. Just because you bought that mic and it doesn't sound good doesn't mean you have to use it. I know that sounds really simple and it could be, but you said you also have an AKG C3000B. I'm not that familiar with those mics, but if I were you, here's what I would do. I would do a blind press conference type um, um, shootout of those two mics. And I would uh, I would record both of them. I would put them as close as you can, uh, make the element as close as they possibly can be to each other, facing your vocal as if you were recording um, your vocal into both of those mics, and each one of those is going to be a keeper. Then put the pop filter to where you sing into the pop filter, and when you sing into the pop filter, um, it's helping to disperse whatever. But you're going you're equally distant from the microphone, and eight inches sounds about right. Um, so uh, I would put both of those mics up and put them at the same, uh, same distance, uh, run them through two separate mic pre's, print them on two separate tracks, and I would label them as such. And then I would do a, uh, a vocal pass. Just one pass is all you need to get the whole song so you have plenty to work with, but you could do a course if you wanted to. Um, sing your vocal into those and then go back to the studio, listen without, without prejudice, and go which one of these passes would I be able to use on this record? Um, and you may find that the C3000 wins and what's keeping you using the, um, the other one, uh, the, the SE electronics is the fact that you're eating the cheesecake, right? You're eating the cheesecake because you made it, you bought it, you have to use it, right? It's not necessarily the case. Um, so that's what I would do, Mike. 
I hope, I hope that helps, man. Um, another thing you can do if it sounds too bassy, and this is the after the after the fact thing. Um, if you just can't get enough low end, if you start pulling that low end out, um, and it just doesn't sound good, if you filter it after the fact, and it just starts to sound thin, um, use a multi band. EQ or multi-band compressor that helps a lot too. It helps with some of that that um, that resonance that that happens. Um, it, I know I, I use it for P-pop sometimes when I don't when when the P-pops um, when I filter it up <clears throat> when there's so many that I can't really cut them out and be efficient um, or uh, when it's it's digging into the low end too much. Um, then I'll use a multiband. I use a C6 a lot, and lately I have uh, just got the um, what is that called? The Neutron. I'm having trouble spelling Neutron. Um, so um, I've been using that as a multiband, and a lot of times I'll let it do the the track assistant, and then I'll take off most of it. I'll, I'll go through the things one at a time and figure out what it's doing. Um, and let it do that. So, Mike, you said I've done that. That's kind of where I'm at. The AKG sounds better, but I still can't get a good sound. Okay, so it could be that um, you're looking at the lesser of two eagle, evil eagles. <laughs> you're looking at the lesser of two evils, right? Not that either microphone is evil, but now that you know that this mic sounds better than this mic, you probably still don't have the right mic, right? Here's another thing I would try to. Is that the only two mics you have? Or is that the only two mics that you would consider vocal mics? Um, let me know that, and I'll come back to this, okay? Okay. Mark says, "How do you get that? In how do you get intimate with the mic without that low effect you're talking about?" Um, if you want, um, if you want a singer that sounds so like intimate with the mic without getting that proximity effect, listen to any Alison Krauss record. Um, she absolutely gets really close to that mic, but she, she knows how to sing into the mic from what I can see. Um, usually it's hard to get in a mic and scream in the mic and sound intimate. A lot of times when you sing into a mic that close, it's somebody that, that really has an experience with that. And when you get intimate, you get really close, right? Um, you have to sing soft and you have to be able to, um, you know, to, to know when you're about to, when, when you know what's about to come out of your mouth and you, and you know how to make it go into the mic the way it should by pulling your head back or turning your head so that you miss a pee pop or something like that. But how do you get that intimate, um, without the low effect you're talking about? Um, my, suggestion would be to 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 not get the proximity effect is to use a different pattern on the mic most everybody thinks that using a cardioid is the only mic pattern it's not it's not sometimes it's not even the best if you go to a mic that has an omni pattern and that's a microphone that it doesn't matter where you sing into the mic um it gets rid of all if not most, if not all, of the proximity effect because that an omni mic doesn't have that big bass buildup. So, um, like if you think about Frank Sinatra's microphone, it's a C48. If I'm not mistaken, terribly mistaken, and I could be, <laughs> that mic is the cardi is the uh, omni version of a U47, right? So it's you can get right up in that mic, and uh, and not get that proximity effect. So Mark, the way you would get that up close to a mic and not get that proximity effect is to change the pattern of it. Cardio, you're always going to run into the problem of having too much bass if you get too close to it. Uh, Omni um, will work better. I use Omni in a couple of conditions uh, when I have to get that really, really close. And you have you don't want anybody screaming in your uh, uh, $3,000 mic, right? So you don't give you don't let them get that close unless they know how to handle the mic, right? Um, but if it's you and you know what you're doing, turn it to turn it to Omni and get up close to the mic and see if you don't get that effect, okay? Um, into NT, you do have a Rode NT 
2A. Man, they make these microphones hard to call, right? Um, remind me, Mike, um, the NT2A, is that a uh, cardioid condenser microphone? Uh, I have an NT5, I think. I think it's a stereo. And I have an NT something else, and I can't remember, but it's a shotgun mic. So I don't uh, I don't know. Hey, Deb. Um, Deb, I, I'm curious to know what kind of vocal mic you use. Deb is a background singer in Nashville. And she's great. She's also got a famous voice. You've heard her on commercials before, too. Deb, what kind of vocal mic do you use? Um Steven says sing off axis. Uh, you can sing off axis. The singing off axis sometimes does help with the low end, but mostly singing off axis helps with the plosives. Okay. So when you sing in a microphone and you say plosive, uh, you get a couple of different kinds of plosives. You get the P from the plosive and then you get the S from the sieve, right? Plosive. And those are areas where it takes a lot of air to make the sounds. Um, um, when you get that sound, when you sing off axis, the air goes past the microphone. You don't get the the explosion that happens with the plosive, right? So um, Deb uses an old groove tube, MD1B. Uh, I haven't used one of those, Deb. Um, let's see. Um, screaming for me is SM7B. Yep, that's a screamy microphone because you can't, you almost can't uh, make those things distort. So, but, but Mark, if you're wanting, if you're wanting that more intimate sound, try the, the, um, the Omni pattern. I think that's cool. Uh, AT440. Um, I know I've used Audio Technica stuff quite a bit. You know what? I've used the, uh, what is that Audio Technica? Uh, I've got one. It's an AT2020. I've got a, a 4030 that I've used for vocals successfully. And I've got a 4060, which is basically a 4050 that's tube. Um, so anyway, so um, so Mike, going back to your, your question about, so Deb and uh, Mark, Stephen, all you guys that are on here and might have suggestions. Um, I don't know everything. So, um, <clears throat> if you have some suggestions, chime in, okay? Uh, what Mike's question is, is about, uh, he's got, um, he can't, he's not happy with his microphone, his uh, vocal sound. So, um, Mike, here's my, here's my suggestion. I would grab every mic you have, as many mic inputs as you have, and I would put all those mics up there because there's something that's going to tell you that if you've paid a lot of money for a microphone, especially, you are going to um, uh, gravitate toward that mic because you spent a lot of money on it, right? Don't be deceived by that. Uh, grab every mic you have, including SM57s, SM7B, uh, the old uh, the old uh, NT5 or NT2A. Grab all those mics and do a press conference. And I've done this before; it really works. Um, do the old press conference. Sing the mic. Sing the same pass. Into, the, into all those different mics and then listen to the different qualities of those mics. And if you're really smart, you will you will um, either hide which microphones those are and then um, and then mix, you know, confuse yourself because when you confuse yourself, you're not then you don't go. You don't know. Um, you don't know which mic is which and you go. That mic sounds really good. Which mic is that? And you may discover that it's a 57, a hundred dollar microphone, right? Um, that's happened before uh, for me. So, um, and that boldness of like, that's when you know that you've done it. It's like, that's when you know that, uh, that you've done your due diligence because you've like, then you can say, I've sung on every mic in this studio and this is the one that sounds the best. Right. And if it still doesn't sound good, then maybe you should be in the market for another another microphone. And I'm sure that these guys here um, will give you some good suggestions. OK. Um, Deb does a lot of voiceovers and and she's recommended that you may try the Omni for voiceovers because, Deb, you probably sing. I think you have a smaller studio like I have and um, rooms. The room sound may be uh, part of the thing. <clears throat> and uh, 
And so if you have to get really close to your mic to kind of like counter the outside noise, traffic, things like that, then put it in Omni, get really close to that thing. Uh, and you heard it from Debbie too. Uh, hey Russ, I'm staying safe, man. It doesn't feel dangerous to me though. <laughs> uh, let's see. It feels like a normal day, except you can't go out to eat, which is one of my, I'm finding I have, I have an addiction to that. I love going out to eat at restaurants. I love going to Mexican restaurants and eating too many salsa and chips. Um, hey, Mark, you said talk about methods for giving vocalists the best headphone mix. Um, we can cover that in another video, but I'll tell you what I do is I give them my mix most of the time. If you notice when you sung in my studio, what I always do is I give you my mix and, and I listen how you're singing into the mic um, or the way you're singing. Uh, not you specifically, but if you hear somebody start to sing sharp, it usually means they're pushing too hard, which usually means that they are, um, uh, they don't hear enough track. When they start to sing flat, in, in, in a lot of cases that I've had, it's usually because they hear too much track and they're singing lazy. So there's a fine balance there, and it's hard to, hard to find that balance unless you're listening to their mix. So usually I'll grab that second set of headphones and put them on and I'll listen to your mix. Usually it's a voice canceling um, uh, or an isolating headphones, not, not canceling, but isolating headphones. Um, uh, so yeah. Hey, Deb uh, wants to know what price point you're, uh, I, I think that's the question to Mike. Uh, which price point are you looking for? Or are you asking me, Deb? I'm not sure. Uh, Deb also says dry and no EQ. That's exactly what I said, Deb. I don't know how long you've been here on the on the broadcast, but um, I do no EQ. I just do a filter, um, you know. But um, but I, I hardly ever do any EQ. And if you have the right microphone, usually you don't have to do a lot of EQ. Yeah. Okay. So I hope I'm not putting these these comments out of context. Um, Mike says, thanks. Hopefully that helps Mike. Um, uh, keep me posted on what you decide. Okay. But I would record all your mics. I would record as many mics as you can. If you only have two or four in your interface, then I would record that many. If you have eight record up to that many, cause that'll give you a, a good try. And, uh, Mark, this reminded me Townsend or slate, uh, digital mics give many selections absolutely and um you can hear on those mics you can hear the difference between omni singing off axis and cardioid and also a little funny story about mark and i don't know how many of you have heard it but mark brought a beautiful townsend labs mic to the studio and we experimented on my on mark's vocal with with U67s, with U47s, with Telefunk and 251s. And then I flipped it over to the SM5 or SM7B. And that's the one that to me sounded the best on his on his vocal. And to me, I don't think that's a waste of a microphone at all because that's an education, right? You can do that on everything you record. Stick that mic in front of something and then experiment with which pattern sounds best. Because now you can do it with one pass, right? That press conference thing is so, so powerful, you know, to record your vocal in there. And on Townsend Labs, you're doing the press conference, but you're doing it on one microphone and you're able to listen to all the different mics and then decide which mic you should buy, right? Um, so, yeah, Mike, uh, Deb is wanting to know what price range you're looking for. Um, sorry, um, that's out of context. Um so, Mike, if you're still here, um, I don't think, Deb, I don't know if if, um, um, if Mike is actually looking for a mic yet. Um, I think he's just looking to get a better sound out of his mic. He's using an uh, SE something, something with a lot of letters and numbers. And he says he never can get the vocal to sound right. And the, the first indicator for that is... Um, is change microphones. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful thing that we tend to forget about. And there's a lot of psychology that comes into switching microphones, especially when you spend a lot of money on a microphone. Um, Mark's talking about headphone mixes here. Would less instruments in the headphones mix give a better performance, like only the piano or acoustic guitar? In some cases. Now, here's one thing that I always did in Nashville, Mike. I mean, a, a Mark. And Debbie can probably attest to this. I don't know why 
but steel guitar seems to be an only a country music thing, which I think steel guitar could go on anything like, like a Hammond B3 can go on anything. A steel guitar played by the right person could go on anything. Um, but here's the thing. Um, fiddle, steel guitar, and non-fretted instruments, even a fretless bass sometimes, um, will a lot of times singers will key off of the wrong thing sometimes. And if you've got, when I would record vocals and I would have the option um, to create a, a headphone mix for them or send them things to listen to, I would usually not send them a lot of unfretted uh, things, even like strings sometimes. Strings will tend to, to play sharp. Um, sometimes strategically sharp, um, and that's a that's a, a story for another broadcast. Um, um, I will take those unfretted things out because I want them to hear only the stuff that has um, definite pitch references. So, um, not necessarily taking everything out of the headphones, but leaving the things loudest that will give them the most uh, good pitch reference. But even pitch these days, I mean, it's great when you got a singer like Debbie um, who sings, you know, her pitch is great. You don't need to do a lot of uh, processing, although I probably, you know, I do processing a lot because like I said yesterday or Monday, it's what people expect these days. They, they perfect, they expect um, the perfect uh, pitch thing, but the best thing to do, Mark, um, is not necessarily net, net the. Well, I need another zipper coffee. Is not necessarily take everything out of the headphone mix, but take everything that's not pitch um, that's going to give them the best pitch reference. So, sorry about the light going in and out here, guys. Um, Mark, uh, Mike, <laughs> man, I'm getting confused with all the marks and mics. Now uh, the Z5600 was about a thousand dollars, but it's new. Okay, so. Mike, so I know that that's probably um, something that's affecting you uh, as far as getting your your vocal sound. You know, it's like it's like um, how would you how would you describe it? It's like buying a painting for your house, and deep down inside, you know that it's ugly, and you shouldn't have bought the painting, but you still hang it on the wall because you paid a thousand dollars for the painting. Uh, don't let that affect you, okay? Um, that That's what, uh, <clears throat> and this is a harsh way of saying it, and this is not what it is, but Dave Ramsey, if you've ever listened to the to the uh, Total Money Makeover or the, what is this show called in Nashville, Debbie? I forgot about it already. Um, he calls it stupid tax, and it's something that we have to pay, but it's a lesson that we learn, right? And it's not the wrong it's not a bad purchase. It was just not the right mic for you. You can still use it for something that needs a ton of low end. So you've got a really thin, uh, you've got a really thin guitar that needs uh, like a, a thin, like a Yamaha acoustic guitar that sounds thin sometimes. That mic will be perfect for it. It's just not right for your vocal, right? It's not, there's no bad mics. There's only bad applications for the mic, right? Um, so Deb, yes, I love it when you, it makes you, make me, makes me feel like you agree with me. When I say yes in all caps, trumpets, strings, if your vocalist is singing sharp or flat, check the extra instruments in their mix. Keyboards are usually the best. Um, so there you go, Mark. <clears throat> Me and Debbie agree. Two out of two people agree <laughs> that uh, those extra instruments sometimes, and I didn't think about brass, but yeah, bones, they're not, there is no definitive uh, pitch for for bones um, because uh, trombones because they they slide it right slide guitar is another thing probably shouldn't be in your headphone mix if you want your singer to sing well sounds like there's an emergency over the next uh, couple blocks over so hopefully let me know if you hear that um, so anyway so we started off this thing talking about how to get um, how to get better vocals and I forgot how I started it. But what we ended up with is, you know, good, good headphone mixes really help take those non-tonal instruments out that are not helping with pit with pitch. Um, Deb, you're going to sing a song demo today and the cops are coming to get you since you have no mask. I can't drink mask with coffee while I'm drinking coffee. Well, you know what? I've, I've thought about this and somebody should do this and send me one. Uh, wow. What is that going on behind me? 
looks like a fireplace. Anyway, somebody needs to have um, a mask with a coffee cup in front of it like this, right? Or a big smile on it. Because the thing that bothers me about masks is you can't see people smiling. And that's what I live for, see smiling people. Um, I would mute my mic, but I'm talking. Um, okay, I've recorded for a few years now with Pro Tools for the life of me. I just can't get a good vocal sound. Mike, here's another suggestion for you, okay? Um, and I'll and I'll leave with this because it's been it's been like 50 minutes, and I don't want to bore you guys. Um, and thanks for the comments; these are great, and it's good seeing you, Debbie. Um, Mike, here's a suggestion for you, and I and I don't want to, I want you to take this the way I mean it. <clears throat> Sometimes when you are a singer, and you also are getting into recording, you're figuring out things as you go, right? Sometimes what you need is just somebody to coach you through something. And sometimes that coach is a good engineer in a studio in the town where you live. Um, um, sometimes you, uh, sometimes one of the things you can do is to get somebody else to record your vocal. Look at what they recorded on. I mean, go to somebody that has a lot of, my dad, go to somebody that has a lot of, um, a lot of experience in this area because although, and I don't know you, Mike, so, um, you could have years and years of singing in the studio. You could be just getting started, but you maybe you've never paid attention to what people are doing in the studio when you're singing. And sometimes that's worth money. That's worth the money, whatever money it takes to do it, just to go to somebody else's studio, see if you like their vocal sound better, find out what they're using and do it. You said you don't have vocal uh, vocals. You don't have vocal studios around there. Let me think on that, Mike. Why don't you come back on Friday and, uh, and, and I will think about that. Um, um, why don't you send me a file of your vocal? Email me your file. Um, crazy slam this week, and I will get to it as soon as I can. But why don't you send me uh, a Dropbox link to Kevin at MixCoach.com? And let me take a listen to it. Maybe I can give you, a, maybe I can give you some insight, Okay. Okay. <clears throat> hey, it's good hanging out with you guys this morning. I missed you yesterday. I really did. Um, I am, uh, just to recap my day, what I'm doing today, I'm about to go in a half an hour, record a video of a sermon that's going to be aired this weekend. And then I'm going to this church. And I'm going to continue setting up for a video shoot that we're shooting today at 12.30 or 12. Uh, we're going to record uh, 12 songs. And... Um, no, Kevin, uh, Mike, it's Kevin at MixCoach.com, M-I-X-C-O-A-C-H, Kevin at MixCoach.com. Uh, just send it there, and I'll, I'll take a listen to it and get back with you, okay? Um, but for the rest of the day, I'm going to be recording uh, music. It's going to be fun. And then tomorrow, I'm going to be recording some more. So every day, every day I'm hustling, hustling. Uh, I don't know who did that. I don't know why I sang that. But anyway, hey, it's been good hanging out with you guys. Uh, thanks for Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for hanging in there like a hair on a biscuit. Okay. <laughs> so it's a Southern thing. Okay. I will let you go for now. Be on the lookout for this course I've got coming out. Okay. I'm still working on it. Um, I just have to find some downtime to record it, but I want to, I'm going to record everything I do in Melodyne so that when you get that vocal take and it's not pitch perfect, I'm going to show you how to fix it. Okay. Uh, for now, I'm going to let you guys go. Um, make sure that you go to mixcoach.com. If you want some free resources I've got on uh, how to um, how to get better mixes, it's three of my best tips for getting better mixes. So go and check that out, <clears throat> and I will see you on Friday, okay? Talk to you guys soon. Bye.